how do you race raisins? They're under starter's orders and they're off and they're straight down... The how can 12 divided by 2 equal 7? And how does a hovercraft work? How? 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 How can I read your mind? You're talking about ESP, read, you know, that sort of reading no, people's no, no, minds. No, no. There's no mind there to read. You can't <laughs> read minds. It's impossible. Now, if the word I'm about to write on this piece of paper is exactly the same word which you two will write down at the end of this how, will I be reading your minds? If you are correct, yes. All right. Is if. it worth money? Yes. Yeah, you can. In the middle of the table, Tempid. along with the word I've written on the piece of paper. Now mm. then, I want you both to really concentrate. Think of a number between one and ten. One and now ten. multiply yeah. that number by nine. Yeah. You're left with a number with two digits. Add those two digits together. Yeah. yeah. Subtract five, and you're left with one number. Yeah. yeah. Now then, as with A, B, C, we have one, two, three. If the number is one, write down A. If it's two, write B. If it's three, write C. Right. If it's four, yeah. write D. If we it's five, yeah, write E. Yeah. Write that letter down. Now, quickly, yeah. write a country beginning with that letter. Write it down. Write it down. <laughs> Quickly, quickly, concentrate, concentrate, concentrate. Freddie, what's your country? Denmark. Gareth. Denmark as well. What have I written down on my piece of paper? Denmark. I have that... successfully read your mind. That is unbelievable. I How'd you do it? How did I do it? How did I do it? Well, it's a bit of a number trick, this. Think of a number, let's say it's three, multiply it by nine, that gives you 27. Add those two together, it will always give you nine. Therefore, when you take the five away, you will always have four. Um... Therefore, the letter will always be D. And how many other countries can you think of that begin with the letter D? Brilliant, Al. How does a hovercraft work? Well, you can build a model at home if you want to demonstrate how the hovercraft works. This is the model made out of a margarine tin, cotton reel and a balloon. How does a hovercraft work? Well, it floats on a cushion of air. Look at that, floating on a cushion of air. That's how it works. That's eh? how it works. Now, you may have travelled on a hovercraft yourself. In fact, the world's biggest hovercraft is the SRN4, and it regularly makes journeys across the English Channel. But how did it get invented? Well, in 1954, Christopher Cockrell was working on a prototype hovercraft that looked a bit like this. It looked like that, did it? <laughs> yep. Yeah. It looked exactly like this. It's not really a hovercraft, but it's the experiment he did to measure how much downforce could be generated by a fan and therefore lift a vehicle. And this is what he made it out of. A hairdryer and a coffee tin. He turned the coffee tin on and it's attached to a set of scales and... Very quickly, he realised that it could uh, generate about 22 grams of lift. He had an idea. Could I improve on that? So what he did was narrow the gap which the air came out with a second coffee tin inserted like that. Now the air could only come out around this edge of the coffee tin. And what that did was make the airflow more manageable, more controllable. And when he measured it on the scales, he found that... It generated a lot more lift, so already Cockrell was well on the way to designing a practical hovercraft. In fact, it was only 11 years between this small experiment and the SRM4, a hovercraft capable of carrying 400 people. This hovercraft, however, carries only three people. It's an Osprey sports hovercraft, but no matter what they're designed for, all hovercrafts work the same. Instead of a hairdryer, a great big fan driven by a car engine which um, drives the air vertically downwards to lift the machine and pushes it out the back to drive me forward. And around the edge of this hovercraft you can see a flexible skirt. And that skirt ensures an airtight seal between the hovercraft and the surface it's running on, whether it be land, sea or... The house studio! Not an easy how to follow, if anyone can. I'm your man. How old 
is an Easter egg. Well, the idea of giving Easter eggs as sweets goes back only as far as Victorian times, when people used to give each other marzipan eggs. Before that, though, they'd give each other real eggs, dyed in a variety of colours, known as pace eggs. These are they. They're rather beautiful, aren't they? They are absolutely beautiful. But how can you make a pace egg? I can show you how, because it's delightfully simple and very, very effective. Well, it would be, wouldn't it? <laughs> Get yourself an ordinary egg mm -hmm. and wrap around that the skin of an onion. OK? You follow Any, onion. Any onion will do. Stick a rubber band around that, or maybe even two, to hold the whole thing in place. Get hold of one of your mum's old stockings and snip off the foot, getting permission first, of course. Drop the egg inside there, like that. Mm -hmm. Then, not the whole thing in place. Going well so far, isn't oh, it? beautifully. Mm -hmm. Even Toppy can understand this. <laughs> <laughs> and then dip it in a pan of boiling water. It is boiling water, so do be careful. Leave it in there for at least ten minutes and be careful when you take it out, cos it'll be hot. When you do take it out, snip it off and then get the whole thing out and you may be delightfully surprised by what you find inside. Look at that. Oh. A lovely marbled effect. Dry it off, rub a bit of cooking oil on it to make it all shiny, and you will be left with a lovely paste egg that looks like that. And if you want different colours, then use food colourings and so on. A sheer masterpiece. Yes, and that's how you make a paste egg. Not bad egg. That's not yes, the how, though. That, well, the how was how old is an Easter egg? Yes, I don't need telling that. Well, in fact, Easter eggs and giving them at springtime festivals goes back a long, long time. In China, they were giving each other eggs painted scarlet as far back as 900 BC. That is 2,892 years ago, and that is how old an Easter egg is. Marvellous. Now, how can you lift an Australian? The same as you pick anything else up, surely. Carol, what are you talking about? Well, I'm actually talking about lifting, but before I show you the Australian version, I want to show you how people normally lift things. Now, often people just bend, not using their knees at all. They keep their legs locked, they bend from the back, pick up a heavy item, putting strain on these mm. lower back muscles, which are very weak, pick up the items and, oh, gosh! Not good. Not good for the health at all. This is how you should lift. Go in between the items. Use the big muscles, the muscles in the thighs and in the shoulders. So bend from the knee, keeping the back straight. Pick up the items, like so. Yeah, Beautifully that's, done. I mean, it's good, sensible advice, but what's it got to do with Australia? Well, for that... Freddie, I'd like you to go to bed. You have been looking rather beaky I recently. I feel one degree yes. under. I don't feel yes. myself. You well, look you down under. You certainly don't look yourself. Yes, really. I feel down Just, under, Tommy. Yes. Well, be a bit more yes. Australian. Yes, yes, OK, I'm off to bed. Yes. Mm. Yes, we're... Yes. Wait a minute, Australia? I'm not too sure about it. <laughs> down, you're real. Why Australian? Why Carol? Australian? Well, this is called the Australian lift. It's a lift that's been developed in Australia and it's often used by nurses. Now, we're the nurses. Uh, Freddie... Just sit up, Wyatt. Thank you. You're the patient. Yep. Uh, knees here on the end of the bed. Yeah. So we're going to use the thigh muscles. Shoulders under the armpits under. there, and we link our arms underneath his knees. Okay. Got, got my your hand. Sure yeah. About yeah. Got my hand. Yeah. Use this hand to push off the bed. Right. And up we go. Right. Ooh. So my back was straight all the time. Your back was straight. We're ah. the nurses. We're using our thigh muscles and our shoulder muscles. It's quite comfortable, isn't it? So what do we do with the patient then? This way, Freddie. Uh, uh, 22 stones, I reckon. What do you say? Solid so you, muscle. Nurses could lift any weight with this, presumably. Absolutely. Don't you? Absolutely. Even good old Fred. Drop, drop him. It. Drop it. <laughs> 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 Excellent. And that is how you can lift an Australian. <clears throat> Another how for you now. How do you play the saw? Why, why, oh, why can't I? I don't know. Over the Rainbow, played by award-winning saw player Bronwen Nash. Bronwen? How do you play the saw? And, and is that a special saw? No, it's, an, it's... Well, it is and it isn't. It's an ordinary saw made 12 inches longer so that you get more notes, because you get the notes by bending the saw. So you, you can know, play sort of... any saw? Yes. You see, more or less, as far as you'd like to go, is the number of notes you get. OK, well, so I've, you... I've got my toolkit, and in my toolkit I have um, my saw, and you can play it with a stick? You can play it with, with a bow. stick, yes. If you're starting, you play with a stick. Show me what to do, then. So you clasp the handle with yeah. you very tightly with your knees, yeah. right? 
then create a, an S shape by bending it like that. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and just then tap you it. you should, well, sort of stroke and tap at the same time. Can you stroke it as well? Yeah, you can hear it. Now That's you're... right. And you sustain the note with the vibrato. Look, yeah. you watch. And you can actually change the note and keep the vibrato going. That shows beautiful so, control, the sort of thing which I don't have. So, I'm um, sure you have other skills. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, being as you're playing um, a household tool, I think I shall join in uh, on a piece for um, spanner and ratchet and saw. Beautiful. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you. That's how you play the saw. Bronwyn and Toppy, a little musical magic. Now, <laughs> how do you race raisins? A simple but highly effective and exciting tabletop racing game you can play at home. Now, you get a jug of lemonade. If you drop a raisin in it, it'll sink straight to the bottom because it's heavier than the lemonade. But gradually the bubbles in the lemonade will stick to the wrinkles in the raisin, making it less dense, and slowly but surely it climbs to the surface. Look at that, right on cue. Bubbles burst, and down it goes again. OK, we are now going to have a little race. If I could just get him out, look at that. Beautifully well held, lovely. Right, we each take a raisin. That's yours, Toppy, Toppy's yeah. tornado. That's yours, Carol, oh, Carol's this is crawler. Carol's a... crawler? Yes, and this is mine, dynamite dynage. <laughs> now, when I give the signal, we drop them in there, and we're having a race up and down, and we are racing for the raisin racing rosette. OK? Is that clear? Yes. How many laps? Now, it just depends on when I get in front. <laughs> uh, I'm now going to hand you over to the official race commentator. <laughs> Here we are now at the start of the Raisin Racing Derby. In they go and down to the bottom. Okay, it's a first. slow start. They're under starter's orders nice and up. they are nice off. Nice Carol's up. Crawler in the lead now. Nice does nice the first nice circuit nicely into to Toppy's Tornado right behind. Oh, Dynamite Dynage in third place. Carol's, Carol's Crawler, crawler going back. Down, down they go again. Down, down. Carol's Crawler in front marginally. Yes. Toppy's Tornado there. Dynamite yes. Dynage. Yes. Coming up now for the final furlong. It looks like Dynamite Dynage. Tremendous surge on the inside. There he goes. And he's won it. A fantastic finish. Absolutely brilliant. Dynamite Dynage wins it. A marvellous, marvellous, exciting. Race. And that's how you race raisins. Hmm. It was mine. Now, how can 12 divided by 2 equal 7? 12 divided by 2, Carol, equals 6. Carol, you know maths. Go on, prove it then. Prove All right, it, then. 12, 1, 2, divided by 2 equals, well, the 12, that's 3 times the 2 times mm -hmm. the 2 over the 2, cross out the 2, 3 times 2 equals 6. six. Bingo! <laughs> You see? Um, Made yourself look a bit stupid. The key to this, how, is that we don't use numbers or symbols like this. We, in fact, go back to Roman times and use Roman numerals. And they're still used today. You see them often on clocks and watches. How do Roman numerals work? In this way. That stands for one. If you have two of those, that stands for two. Mm. Now, a V stands for five. If you put the V there, you have five, six, seven, V, one, one. Then the X, well, that stands for ten. But how do Roman numerals get you out of a fix? Ah, well, you see, these were terribly, terribly difficult to multiply and divide with. So if you wanted to learn how to do that, you had to go to Roman University. And I've always wanted to teach you to a lesson, so follow me to Howard's Universitus. Now, I think you two need a degree, the third degree. Sit us there, us, please. Us. Now, us. How can 12 divided by 2 possibly equal 7? This Mrs. is X11, one, one, which is 12. Can't. Listen. Do you understand? Right. No, X11 one, one is Miss, 12. Miss, I don't Take. understand this either. X11 one, one is 12. Yeah. 1 and 1 is 2. Yeah. X divided by the 1 and the 1 Please, is Miss. I don't understand, and he doesn't understand this. To divide something by two, you take half of it away, do you not? Yes, miss. X11 one, one is 12. Yes, divide miss. it by two, take half of it away. What are we left with? V -I -I. Which is... Seven. And that is how 12 divided by two can equal seven. And that is... Hours. 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 For now. Two are See? so bad.